I'm going to ask you a question. Do you know what an ant and an antelope have in common? Besides just the name, <laughs> what, do, what does an ant and an antelope have in common? Stay tuned. The answer is coming. But I want to keep you just on the edge of your seat, <laughs> trying to figure out what is it? What do they have in common? I'm dying to know. It's going to be so great. We're in a, in a series, a summer series. Okay, I didn't have anything else for intro. That, that's what I came up with. We're in a summer series called Words of Wisdom from the book of Proverbs. And I don't know if I've ever preached a, like a long series I've, in Proverbs. I've maybe taken one chapter before or something. But Proverbs is the greatest book. It's a book of wisdom. And, and it just happens to have 31 chapters. And I know many, many Christians who, in addition to their other Bible reading, read one chapter of Proverbs every day, over and over, year in, year out, because we want to be wise. We want to live wisely. And that's where you find it, is in the book of Proverbs. So uh, next week, I'm super excited. We're starting a new mini-series. So within Proverbs, kind of breaking it into some chunks by topic, next week, we're starting a, 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 a mini-series on how to have great relationships in a wise way. So everyone, everyone has relationships of one kind or another. You are going to love this series. I'm, I'm getting excited for it. But today, we're wrapping up a little four-week mini-series. And I didn't even have a title for this series, I don't think. It's just I, I grouped the titles uh, around a practical thing. This is the, the last few weeks have been Guard Your Heart, Choose Your Friends. Remember Pastor Christian brought that one? Weigh Your Words was last week on Father's Day. And then today I want to talk to you about manage your money. Manage your money using wisdom principles from the book of Proverbs. When you think about uh, money, it is something that pretty much every single day we're either earning it, like working to earn it, or we're spending it, or we're wishing we had more of it, or we're budgeting it, or we're saving it, or we're investing, like literally every single day, pretty much, the money, we have an interaction with money, like almost every person in one way or another. If you're putting on clothes, those clothes were bought with money. Like it's just such an, a central part of our lives. And yet, I read a statistic that last year, 41% of American families uh, said that money was a big source of tension in their home. So uh, four out of ten people are saying it's tense when we're talking about money or we're dealing with money. Marital conflict about money tends to be more frequent and more intense than any of the other marital conflict topics. It's the tense one. It's, it's the one that, like, you just can never get away from it, and which is usually unresolved at the end of the discussion. It's really just a unique, unique topic in our lives. But there's some good news, and we find it in the Bible. And the good news is that God invites you to participate in his prosperity. God invites you to participate in his prosperity. I kind of tricked you a few weeks ago and said, uh, do you believe God wants you healthy, wealthy, and wise? And, and everyone's like, I think the answer must be no, because <laughs> God never has fun or wants us to do anything good. And I was like, of course he wants you healthy, wealthy, and wise. Absolutely. Yes. Some of that's going to happen right here in this life, and some of it's going to happen in the next life. But in the next life, it completely happens. So that is God's goal for your life. He, he wants to invite you to participate in his prosperity. And how, one of the ways I know that is that he gave you the book of Proverbs. It's a book that is full of verses of scriptures about prosperity, about finances, about foolishness and wisdom regarding our finances. And so today I want to do, uh, what I want to do is to look at a few principles. There are wise principles to help you manage your money well and prosper. So the first one is this, hard work pays off. That is a biblical principle, and you find it all over the book of Proverbs. Hard work pays off. 
in Proverbs 13, 11, it says, Wealth from get-rich-quick schemes quickly disappears. So it acknowledges that you may get some wealth from a get-rich-quick scheme, but it quickly disappears. Whereas wealth from hard work grows over time. Slowly, perhaps, but more solidly. Proverbs 21.5 says, Good planning and hard work lead to prosperity, but hasty shortcuts lead to to poverty. So there is a certain action, a certain mobility about hard work that leads you toward prosperity. In Proverbs 13, 4, there's a little contrast going, and it says, lazy people want much, but get little. But those who work hard will prosper. And you remember, uh, if you were here for the introduction to the book of, uh, of Proverbs, we know that in, in all these short Proverbs, which is quite a bit of the book of, of Proverbs, there's usually either a contrast, so you're looking for that but in the middle, or there is a parallel where the same thing is sort of stated twice to give you the nuances and the meaning. So there, there's a contrast here. Lazy people want much, but get little, but... Those who work hard will prosper. So the principle is hard work pays off, but how? How, how, does, how does it pay off? Like how, how, do you, how, do you, how does that necessarily mean that you're going to prosper? Well, hard workers make a difference in their world. So part of the payoff is not just in your wallet. That's right. yeah. But hard work pays off in making the world a better place. Making your family, your household a better place. Making your neighborhood a better place. Making your school, your, your office, your work, your neighborhood a better place. Hard work pays off. It makes the world better. Hard workers are promoted. Good bosses, and I put that description on purpose, good bosses appreciate hard work. They notice that. And they, they want to reward you or promote you or do something to say that they appreciate. Hard work... Uh, hard workers are assisted. I don't know if you've ever, if, if you're the kind of person who likes to serve or help, when you see someone struggling, what do you do? You want to just rush in and help them. They're working hard. You want to help them. Someone is uh, coming up to uh, a doorway uh, that has to be manually opened, and they've got a triple stroller and a baby hanging off the hip. You just, like, you see they're working hard. You, you, it's just a natural thing. You want to rush in and assist. Hard workers get assisted. I uh, think of it uh, the same uh, principle in a different way. Parents are much more likely to pay for college for a student who's working hard and trying to get as much out of it as possible. Hard work pays off. And if parents see uh, uh, their, their college student just partying or wasting or not showing up for classes, that the opposite will be true also <laughs> for them. Because it's, it's a biblical wisdom principle, hard work pays off. You know what? God works hard. Pastor Shelley prayed it earlier today. Our God never sleeps, never slumbers. He is always working on your, on your behalf. God never takes a day off from being God. When he created the world, he instituted, he, he purposely chose to take a day of rest, to set that in motion, that principle in the universe, and to be an example for us, but he does not physically need a day off. So if you call out to God in prayer on his day off, he is not, he doesn't have a day off. He is always there 24-7 helping you. So God works hard and he has infused the world with the principle that hard work attracts prosperity and laziness attracts poverty. Hard work attracts prosperity. Laziness attracts poverty. There's a, a really cool chapter. I, I just could not squeeze it all into one message, but Proverbs chapter 6 is so cool on this, on this topic. And in the beginning of the chapter, he says uh, Solomon, who's writing the, uh, much of the book of Proverbs and trying to help his son, trying to help the next generation follow God wisely, Solomon says, hey, look at the ants. Those little bitty ants with little antennae and the, and the legs. Look at the ants. Take a lesson from them. No one forces the ants to work. 
Uh, they, there may be a, little, a hierarchy of little ants, but there's no one with a uniform on and a whistle saying, hey, you, quit slacking, get to work. And yet, all summer, they store up food for winter. Their hard work grows over time and becomes a blessing to them later. And Solomon said, go take a lesson from them. The ants have got it figured out. When you work hard, when you spend less, when you save the rest, your prosperity will grow over time. Now, on the flip side of hard work, Proverbs 23, 4 says, don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Be wise enough to know when to quit. So we, in this day and age, love side hustles. But is the side hustle going to wear you out so you can't do your main hustle and your side hustle? Is, your, is that side hustle going to take you out of worshiping God? Are you like, well, I got to have my side hustle, and that has to happen Sunday morning. Like, you've got to watch those side hustles. And Proverbs itself, this book, brings the balance. Don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Be wise enough to know when to quit. God has put this, uh, several principles into the world. And one of them is that God expects you to have a life rhythm of work and rest. Mostly work. Six days on one day off, but that day off is commanded by God. And there are many things in this message today that are for Garen. So I'm just letting you hear as I preach to myself because God has put a rhythm into the world that he blesses. And he blesses a work for six days, rest for one day rhythm. That is what God blesses. So you and I, we, we, we got to take and receive the Sabbath gift that God has given us. He, is, he expects us to get some rest. And if, when you receive his gift, when you, when you schedule in time for rest and worship and reflection and investing time with your family and friends, then you prosper, but not necessarily in the only way you think of when I say prosper. You will prosper spiritually. You will prosper physically. You will prosper relationally. You will prosper emotionally when you align yourself with the biblical rhythms of life. So one day a week is to worship the Lord. It's to be with family and friends. It's to stop and celebrate how much we got done last week. Last week was awesome. We got a ton done last week. And every so often you just, you just stop and you say, Lord, Thank you for the health, the breath, the connections, the tools to get that stuff done. I give you glory. Even though I worked really hard, you worked through me. That is what the Sabbath is for. So hard work pays off. But probably the most ignored but most impacting financial wisdom principle is this. Debt is dangerous. Debt is dangerous. Hard work pays off. Debt is dangerous. Proverbs 22.7 says... Just as the rich rule the poor, so the borrower is servant to the lender. Now, we don't think of that in those terms these days, but that principle is still true. That is a wisdom principle of God. The borrower is servant to the lender. In other words, the lender is calling the shots now with your money because you just made a contract to give that lender your money every month or every week or whatever it is. Proverbs 22, verses 26 and 27 says, Don't agree to guarantee another person's debt or to put up security or collateral for, anyone, for someone else. If you can't pay it, even your bed will be snatched from under you. In other words, co-signing for somebody else can very well lead to ruin for yourself. This is, this is a pretty intense and specific a command and bit of wisdom, but the dangers of debt are real. Co-signing actually becomes your debt. 
If you co-sign for someone else, a kid, friend, family member, whatever, if you, if you say, I will guarantee their debt if they can't pay, it is now your debt too. Right. And until that debt is gone, it is a weight on you. And if they ever default, the reason they needed a co-signer in the first place is because they are in a more likely category to default, perhaps a first-time borrower or something like that. Um, then you, you basically are saying, I, I'm taking that debt. I'm planning on, on paying that other person's debt. Debt is a gamble that you will have the money in the future to pay it off. Debt is a gamble that you will have the health in the future to keep working. Death, uh, uh, debt is a gamble that your company still wants to hire you and still is going to be a vibrant company and does not have a layoff in the future. That's a, that's a big gamble. Again, this is something God's working on me. And I'm so glad our church doesn't have any debt. Praise the Lord. That is awesome. Uh, and, and, but personally, it is a struggle. Uh, and it is a shift in mindset that the Bible is calling us to. Proverbs 6, again, says that if you have co-signed for somebody, if you have put your name on someone else's debt, then uh, in a sense you've taken on their debt, and Proverbs 6 says, go right now. Run like an antelope. There it is. <laughs> Run like an antelope escaping from a hunter. And the kind of a hunter that would be after them would be a lion. Uh, chasing after them. And uh, Proverbs, uh, God, God's wisdom found in the book of Proverbs says, if you have co-signed for someone else, you stop right now. Put your fork down if you're eating. You stop right now. Run to those people. Get down on your knees and beg them to take your name off that contract. It's that serious. That, that's one of the stronger warnings in the Bible. And it, it's that idea of not just uh, taking on someone else's debt, but even your own debt. It is something that we just need to get out of our lives. Debt makes it so that it's harder to say yes to what God calls you to do with your money. And that's not the position that God wants his kingdom people in. So drop everything, swallow your pride, and go get your name off that contract or go pay off your debt if it's your debt. So what do an ant and an antelope have in common? They both illustrate a wisdom principle about finances in the book of Proverbs. So the ant reminds you of the principle, hard work pays off. Hard work, pays off. Hard work pays, off. pays off, right? And the antelope reminds you to run like a lion's chasing you, to get freed up from debt because debt is, debt is, debt is, I, I don't think you believe it yet. Debt is, yeah, it is. That's what the Bible says. But the most important financial wisdom principle of all is this one. God is your provider. God is your provider. Man, I loved our worship songs we sang earlier in this service today because just song after song after song says, I trust you, Lord. You are trustworthy. You are going to take care of me. You're going to provide for my needs. God is trustworthy because God is your provider. And how you manage your money, and you notice today I'm talking about management. How you manage your money is often a reflection of the condition of your faith. When you trust in your own ability, when you trust in your own money, your own resources, then you tend to overwork and overworry because you know you're frail and you know you might break your leg next, next week or whatever. And ah, what will I do then? So when it's all on you, the worry increases exponentially. You might even be tempted if you think it's all on you to take advantage of someone around you, to kind of step on them for you to get ahead or you to get higher. But that is not the wise thing to do. Proverbs 11.28 says, Trust in your money and down you go. Trust in your money and down you go. But the godly flourish like leaves in spring. The godly prosper. So I hope you're picking up today. There's an element of prosperity that is financial. But prosperity is so much bigger than that. Pro uh, prospering your spirit, prospering your relationships, prospering in your life. 
And in Matthew uh, chapter 6, verse 33, Jesus said, seek the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the, is, is the sphere where God rules, where God provides, where God takes care of you, where God leads you. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. Live in a way that pleases God and he will give you everything you need. Okay, so that is a biblical promise. Now, whenever I, whenever I preach, especially when I preach on anything to do with finances or prosperity, I always ask myself, does this work in Southeast Asia? Is this actually a principle that is a universal principle? Or is this just a little feel-good American thing because I, I happen to be born in the United States of America? And we're talking today about biblical principles. So I believe this is a promise of God that when you seek first the kingdom of God, you live righteously, that he will give you everything you need. Uh, Pastor Shelley and I had the opportunity to go to Burkina Faso in, in West Africa. And the places where we were in the country were, were very underdeveloped, were very uh, poverty stricken. And yet what we experienced there, I, I just still see those kids uh, swarming around that school uh, and uh, I had uh, set a, a water bottle, my, my, that water bottle right there, in the windowsill. Windows have no glass there. Uh, so I set it in the windowsill, and then it accidentally got bumped and fell out. And those kids just rushed towards it and made it a toy. Big smiles on their, on their faces. Their life was good. They didn't have everything that, that uh, a person from the United States of America requires for a good life but they had a good life. They were prospering, and their faith was in Jesus, and they were prospering. And on that day, I bet they said, oh, Jesus, you've given us a toy. Thank you so much. We're so happy that you thought of us today, Lord. Isn't that prospering? That is prospering. I feel like that is prosperous. God will provide for you. He is your provider. That is his promise. You won't always have all you want, but God promises to supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. And that's why God invites you into his to participate in his prosperity. That's why he gave us these principles. If you could really grab hold of this good news, it would improve the quality of your life. Your financial stress and worry would go down and it would be replaced with peace and calm because you would just go, I trust God. I don't have everything I want. But I trust God that he's got my best interests in mind. Your finances, both now and in the future, would be solid because you'd be built on godly wisdom. You're, you have a right attitude towards finances and material things. Your friendships and relationships wouldn't be hurt by money problems because you're not stressing over it. You're trusting God instead. We all want that. We all, we all want that stress-free, prosperous, depending on God life. But so often we trust more in our own finances, our own resources, our own money, rather than trusting in God. Maybe you've tried get-rich-quick schemes. We have. When we were first married, we had this scheme thing where we were sending out reports, uh, that which cost $5 cash, do not send checks, in an envelope. And so to, to make this happen, we went and bought these cases of envelopes from Costco and we still have them today. 35 years later, we, there were so many envelopes. And you know what? I have in my pocket all the money we received from that Get Rich Quick scheme. <laughs> Big zero. But it did cost us quite a bit in envelopes <laughs> and in stamps. Oh, my goodness. Get Rich Quick schemes. We hope to get rich with no hard work. But that's not the principle. Hard work pays off. Maybe you gamble just a little bit with lottery tickets. Or maybe you've kind of moved beyond that level to poker nights or nights at the casino. Hoping to get rich with no hard work. Maybe you're tempted sometimes to just fudge a little on your time card. Round up to the nearest 30, 60 minutes. I had an employee years ago who did that. And they came and confessed because the weight of that sin was not worth it to them. It did not outweigh the little bit of financial gain that came from that. Maybe you've co-signed on someone else's debt or maybe you got your own debt. I have, I have debt. 
we just so desperately want to get paid off. Seems like we get make some progress and then fall back, make some progress. Why don't we believe in real life that God is our provider? Why don't you believe that? Why don't you believe that God wants you to prosper? Perhaps you have a false picture of who God is or how God is. He's, he's your good father. He's your good provider. And what he says yes or no to is good for you. God wants you to prosper in all those ways we've been talking about. Sometimes in this life, you only prosper in one of those ways. Like our, our little school friends in Burkina Faso. They were prospering. Not in every way. They didn't have really finances to share, but they were prospering. Their life was good. And God sent a Christian school to them where there's nothing around but just some bushes and some dirt. God was, God was making them prosper as they followed him. Pretty cool. Maybe you're suspicious of God and his motives. Like you just sort of suspect, I bet he wants to smack me down. Well, that, that is not, the, that is not the, the attitude of a, of a person seeking God as provider and trusting him. There's so much pressure all around us from social media. We have so much FOMO, fear of missing out. And you know what? Whatever God gives you is what you can handle, and it's going to be good. He's got you in the palm of his hand. If you just embrace that, that God is your provider, how, how would your attitude change? How would your thinking change? What, what one action would you do differently if you would just really embrace that? God, you're my provider. What would change? Let's ask the Holy Spirit what could change and what, what needs to change in our lives. Would you stand to your feet uh, and let's just pray. I'd love to just pray for you. Uh, online, would you make a, a place of prayer just right where you are? What, um, if you Stand if you can, if you're not driving right now. Stand and let's just pray and talk to the God who is our provider. Would you bow your heads with me and just kind of shut out distractions right now? Lord, I thank you for the invitation to participate in your prosperity, Lord. And I know some of that is contingent on us applying the principles in your word that you've given us. So, Lord, we lay our, our lives before you. We lay our thoughts, our minds, our hearts, excuse me, we lay our actions, our habits before you right now. And we even invite you, Holy Spirit, to come and look us over. Look over how we do life. And Lord, my experience with you is, is that you typically just put, gently put your finger on one thing at a time where we can come closer to you. Lord, would you do that? Would you put your finger on just one thing? What's one thing that we can do? Uh, maybe we're going to start uh, to add some hard work. Maybe we're going to get out of debt or just begin to trust you as our provider. Lord, I pray, Lord, just, just put your finger on it right now. Lord, I'm just going to be quiet for just a moment. Speak to us, Lord, I pray. Speak to us. What's one attitude you want to change? What's one action you want to change in our lives? Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for being here. Thank you for, thank you for touching on that. And for, for those of us who haven't heard anything specific clearly quite as yet, I pray that throughout this day, Holy Spirit, you'd work on us. We invite you. We open the door. Come, come, come and speak to us. Come and lead us. Come adjust us. And Lord, I just pray that may each of us prosper, Lord, in our heart and soul, in our bodies, in our bank accounts, in our friendships and our families, Lord. May we prosper according to your definition of prosperity. Now, with your heads bowed, still in an atmosphere of prayer, I just want to invite you to put your faith in Jesus Christ. Put your faith in him to save you. To, uh, put your faith in him to, that you would become his apprentice and follow after him, follow his lead. How do you do that? Turn from your sin, turn your life over to Jesus, and let him lead. Be saved. Be become a Christian, a follower of Jesus today. If you would like to do that, to make that decision today, would you just raise your hand? And I will just pray for you specifically. Uh, and I, I see people uh, just making a commitment, some making a new commitment, some making a recommitment. Online, same thing. You can raise your hand to God and he can see you there. Hey, everybody, would you just repeat a prayer after me and pray this to Jesus? If you are, if you are putting your faith in Jesus today, pray it right to him. And we're going to support you in prayer. Let's pray after me. Jesus, Jesus. 
I invite you into my life. I acknowledge I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin and make me new. I choose to follow you and let you lead starting now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And if you put your faith in Jesus, that, that's so great. When, when you put your faith in Jesus, you ask him to forgive you of your sin, the answer is always yes. You are, the, you are a beginner Christian right now, a follower of Jesus Christ. And w speaking of following Jesus, we have a, an online course that we'd like to put in your hands. We have purchased the book through the giving of our church, and we have purchased the course and done all that. We want to just hand it to you. So I want to ask you today, if you have put your faith in Jesus and you don't yet have the Following Jesus course, I want to encourage you to meet Larry at the Following Jesus table in the lobby and he'll just take a second. He'll give it to you and just bless you with that because we want to take the next step, not just the first step. Amen? Amen. 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 Wow. Do you feel like you're a little bit more wise? Yeah. Yeah, I know. So this is, this is uh, something that I think would be really cool for us this week. When you uh, have a situation with your finances, you're like, you know, I always do it this way. Just take one little second and go, Lord, is that what you want me to do, or do you want me to do something else? Just take one second and just ask the Lord. We are all about really applying the word here. We're not just coming and doing the church thing. We are going to live out God's word. Amen? We are going to see God prosper us as we follow him, and I believe that for every one of us. All right. Well, we are going to have a great week. Next Sunday is 4th of July weekend. We know that we have freedom in Jesus. Amen. So we're going to be celebrating that as well as just enjoying uh, being together. And so we'd love to have you come back next week. God bless. Have a great week.